So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, July the 1st. So some of you are traveling, heading for that big 4th of July here if you're here in the United States. Celebration coming up on Monday. Some people are celebrating over the weekend. This is episode number 165 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. My name is Frederick Dunn and this is The Way to Be. How hot is it outside? 84 degrees Fahrenheit and climbing right now. Sunny. Potential for some rain, maybe a little later. What's that in Celsius? 29 degrees Celsius. So I hope you enjoy the opening sequences because I was outside this morning making those today. And uh, what are the bees on? Privets, milkweed, sumac, and clover. There are on other stuff too, I'm sure, but that's just the, the quick list on my property right here. The heavy load right now is milkweed. You might have noticed... A couple of the bees seem to struggle on the milkweed. Sometimes you'll see a honeybee with its foot caught in a blossom on a milkweed plant, and it's just hanging there. You could even find one dead. That's because the milkweed plant is designed to trap honeybees only momentarily while it attaches its pollen to them, and they're forced to take it back to the hive where they can't really use it. But the milkweed spreads its pollen from plant to plant that way. So sometimes that's why you see that. And you'll see little yellow tiny paddles on their feet, and that's milkweed pollen. So that's interesting. What else do we have going on? Do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, and the watering situation. Keep in mind, because we don't have rain in a lot of places, and it's really hot, your bees can handle it if they have lots of fresh water. So at the closing of that sequence, we had water. So I have what uh, I've always called my garden hose oasis. So all it is, is I took this year drip hose. So that's that black hose that people use to slow water their gardens. And you put your tap on really low and it just oozes out and then the water drips. So I thought, wow, good idea. Maybe I'll use that for honeybees. And I'll set it up on a bunch of cinder blocks and stuff like that. So as it drips off of this hose, because you can get really short segments of it, you don't have to get a whole garden length. I think it's like four feet long and it forms a loop. So anyway, you can put your garden hose on that, put it on something high and let the water cascade down because the honeybees like to spread out and get the water where it's dripping or running down onto some porous surface like concrete. So that's working really well. I'm glad I did it. What else do we have going on? I think that's it so far. I hope we get rain. I don't know what you've got going on, but we can actually use it. The good news is you don't have to mow, and you shouldn't be mowing very often because of that clover that's growing up in your lawn. And don't be afraid to run up and down your neighborhood with a sack of clover seed and just spread it on people's yards. Now that they've finished their spring treatments, maybe you can sneak some clover in there. This perennial always comes back. Question number one, kicking it right off. And if you want to know what we're going to talk about today, look down in the video description, and it will list all the topics in order. And the first one comes from Renee. Smoke seems to make my bees rather angry. They do not like getting smoked and they sting me every time. Though they sting when I'm just sitting near my hives as well. I've gotten stung more this year at night just sitting on my porch. Had to abandon my back porch. But that leads me to something that I see when I go and look at other people's hives and I like to see how they smoke their bees. The way you smoke your bees plays an important part. Now there are alternatives to smoking your bees, especially on really hot, dry days. We're gonna talk about that later today because somebody else asked a question related to that. But right now let's talk about the anatomy of a smoker. Smoke fuel plays. And I don't remember if it was Bee Culture or the Bee Journal, but they had a recent article that compared a lot of different smoker fuels so maybe you could look that up, but what I've used, and it didn't score very well, I'm going to be honest, the fuel that I use is pine shavings. And that's because I have it already for my chicken coops, for bedding, for the nest boxes, and everything else. So it's already here. And the other thing is I'm not spending hours out in the bee yard smoking, so I don't need a fuel that lasts hours at a time. The duration of one of my inspections is probably 30 minutes or 40 minutes. But what I wanted to go over is smokers are pretty standard fare, you know? It's the equipment that comes with a lot of beginner bee kits. And so a recent friend, I was looking at their hives, and I noticed when he was smoking, 
bits and pieces of the smoke fuel is flying out the cone end of the smoker and hitting the hive. I thought, why is smoker fuel flying through that? Smokers are designed to do several things, but the first is to provide you a non-flammable container where you can light the fuel and it'll generate smoke and then at the same time provide fresh air flow. Comes through the bottom here. That rises and goes out through the top and it's cone shaped because that's restricted so that when you puff the bellows here it concentrates the smoke and brings fresh air in at the bottom. Now the most basic smoker that is designed for you to burn fuel is just this. The metal container, the cone, the hole on the bottom, and a bellows on the back. Better smokers, the step up is you've got a cage around it. So whatever your smoker leans against, it won't pass on that heat and potentially cause combustion. The other thing is I look at the bottom of people's smokers. Is there a standoff there? Or does the actual smoker burn chamber sit right on flammable material. Heaven forbid it's a polystyrene insulated cover, something like that. So the standoff extends the cage around the smoker, also extends underneath. So when you set it down, airspace, airflow, takes it away, and now you don't risk combustion. The other part is you'll see a hook on top, some easy way for you to open it. Remember that it's going to be hot later. So when it comes time to open that up, a nice loop like that is easy to grab onto. Some people wear bee gloves. If you're wearing leather gloves, you don't care anyway. But I want you to notice what's in the top here, and I hope it shows up. That is not just an opening into the cone. There's a spark arrestor there. Lots of creosote built up there. That prevents, if you get super smoking and you start really puffing away because you're trying to really get it relit, or maybe the bees are all after you and you're one of those people that generates a fog of war to protect yourself from the bees because people smoke them smells, smoke them, smoke people around them, and they puff it all over to make yourself smell like smoke and cut down on the bee activity there. So we want to reduce their ability to spread their alarm pheromone and we want to calm them, not upset them. So spark arresters, so hot parts don't come through because the smoke already bothers the bees. Even the best fuel that you can find bothers the bees. So we, when it comes out, it should be cool to your hand right there, especially when you're really puffing it. The other thing is the burn chamber. This is a double burn chamber, so it's got a removable basket. And then see this bottom piece, a little standoff there? That's because air comes in underneath of it, rises through it, so the combustion happens down here and it burns through as the material settles in your burn chamber insert. Some smokers don't have that. They just have the open container like that. This is a better design, just in my opinion. I have bunches of these. I load several of them up and I line them up, but that's because the smoker fuel can burn through pretty fast sometimes. I don't want to reload it, so I pack it with pine shavings. Some people use pine straw. In fact, uh, pine needles are the number one used smoker fuel here in the United States, but where I live, we don't have a lot of long pine needles to do that. And they also didn't score very well. So that led me to thinking about other smoker fuels while I'm on the topic here. But that's the type of smoker that I like. It doesn't matter who makes it. This particular one comes from Flow from their website, honeyflow.com. But uh, there are a lot of smokers that have those features, so that's what you're looking for. Uh, a removable combustion basket so you can load it, clean it easily, and so air fuel comes underneath instead of just packing it straight down. And you have a spark arrestor on the top and you have a cage around it to insulate it from burning things up. But uh, most recently, the smoker fuel that I'm testing here that worked pretty good, you know, is mowing the yard. I hate mowing. But sometimes when the grass is wet, it collects up underneath your mowing deck and uh, really gets dense under there to the point where some people have to get under their um, lawn mowing decks with a power washer or something like that or they have to scrape it off with uh, paint scrapers and it, you find out the grass is really dense. So what I did was I took a bunch of those wet clumps of grass that are tightly packed that were sticking up under the mower and I dumped them right into my trash can. I have a galvanized trash can that I collect pine shavings in that I use for my smoker fuel. 
And I put those in there and they dried out and uh, they're really tightly packed. And that made me think one of the top smoker fuels was animal manure, like cow manure. And I was thinking, yeah, that makes sense. Because like back in the Plains days with the Plains Indians and everything, they burned what they called buffalo chips, which were the waste material from buffaloes. Now, I don't know if you've been around too many cows and horses and bison, but uh, all it is is grass, really, that wasn't digested by those animals, and it drops out. So that is tightly packed grass. Then when it dries out, you have smoker fuel. Now, I don't know if the bees are going to like it or not, but it's a dense smoke. It burns for a long time. So, food for thought. If you have a favorite smoker fuel that's widely available, that people should be trying, maybe you could write that down in the comment section and uh, let us know. So the smoking procedure to keep your bees calm, light puffs of smoke at the entrance. And then as you open the hive, light puffs of smoke. And read the bees while you're going through the hive. So, if the bees are not on top, if there aren't guard bees that are watching your every move and their little forelimbs are up and some of them even take to the air and maybe hopefully you're wearing a veil and if they start to bounce off the veil, some light smoke, just enough to get those bees to stop paying attention to you and get them to go back down in the frames. Don't overreact and puff a lot of smoke in there because what this causes the bees to do, first of all, is, is panic. They think there's a fire nearby so they're consuming resources and they're seeking deep shelter in the hive. So when we're doing an inspection, an inspection, each time we move a frame, we're, you know, exposing another hiding place as far as the bees are concerned. And they're going to get the most upset when we look at their brood area because that's where it's critical. The queen's there. If there are guard bees, they're defending that area. They're defending the queen. The nurse bees on those frames just panic. They don't fight back at all which is why often you'll see, you know, when you pull up a frame of brood and the nurse bees are all there and you put your finger down and you can push them around so you can see in the frames and stuff. And you wonder why don't those bees sting the finger of that bee person that's trying to inspect those frames when they're actually touching the bees and pushing around their fingers. That's because they're nurse bees. They're non-defensive. They are the least aggressive insects in the entire hive. But keep smoking them and they get really upset so smoke enough to get them to back down and then back off with the smoking it's that easy we don't want our bees to sting us bees that sting us those are dead bees question number two this comes from sherry from rawlings virginia let's see i'm a new beekeeper and i have two purchased hives a nuke and a package and have a swarm that showed up to a large hole an oak tree about 10 feet up all in the month of march and there's a lot of clover white and red in the fields and lots of flowers blooming etc but some of the bees have started going to my hummingbird feeders are they lazy or opportunistic do you think they have enough nectar flow or pollen, today being Tuesday, 6th through the 28th? Should I take my hummingbird feeders down for a while or don't worry about it? I'm going to say don't worry about it. Here's the thing. You're going to hear this a lot. If the bees are on syrup, then there must be nothing else for them to eat. And then when there is something else, when there's nectar and pollen out there, they'll abandon syrup. It's been my experience that if you mix up sugar water and put it out available for the bees, any time of the year, you're going to get bees feeding at that sugar water. Now, the amount of sugar that's in your hummingbird feeder is much lower than what the bees could get. So during times of dearth, which you are describing, uh, possibly, you know, if they're not heavy, if they're not bringing on a lot of resources, they might be going to other easy access sugar syrup, sucrose. So, we'll talk about this uh, hummingbird feeder. If you've got your own hummingbird feeders, this is the style that beekeepers should keep. It doesn't have to be this specific brand, but if you notice, there's not a reservoir above it. And the reason there isn't is because these are what we use here. If there's a reservoir above it, then it constantly fills the base of your feeder 
as your, if Orioles are trying to get in there, but it's primarily for hummingbirds, anything that's got a long enough tongue to reach the nectar in this feeder is going to go to that feeder and exploit the resources. Honeybees have limited length to their tongues. So, if you have a feeder like this with a reservoir in the bottom that's under your control, all you have to do is have the level of the nectar in this reservoir below three-eighths of an inch, and the bees won't be able to get it. And then the hummingbirds can still get it, so you've solved your problem. This particular one also comes, there's a moat in the middle that's an ant moat, so ants don't come through or go down and get to your feeder as well. But sometimes hummingbirds are chased away by bees because once bees find a source, they go nuts over it. You might also have a neighbor that's like, your bees are on my hummingbird feeders and uh, I don't like it. So, wow, have you checked out these hummingbird feeders? They're the best, way better than what you're using. They have a landing perch for the hummingbirds. Hummingbirds rarely perch when they're feeding, but they'll land here, I noticed, and guard the feeder. So sometimes they do perch. So that's it, it's the style of feeder. If you can get your surface of your nectar three eighths of an inch away from that entrance hole, you're gonna be in business and the hummingbirds are gonna be back there and your honeybees won't. But anytime sugar syrup is made available, I wouldn't call the bees lazy, but I call them opportunistic. They're gonna find that sucrose and they're gonna be bringing that home. Their whole job is to get the most resources back to the hive in the least amount of time. So, question number three comes from Jim, Morganton, Georgia. I like the way Jim puts this. I'm an 80 year old first year beekeeper, so time is of the essence. I have three Langstroth hives I bought from a beekeeper with excess equipment. Very bad idea. I installed three packages on March the 28th of this year and they seem to be doing well and putting up some honey even in the super. I am not satisfied with the Langstroth hives. So by next spring, I will have built three Lands Horizontal hives to replace the Langstroth hives. He doesn't explain why he's not happy with the Langstroth hives. I have viewed many videos on how to convert a Langstroth hive to a Lands hive. I think he's talking about Langstroth frames to Lands frames because as he gets into what he says all of the methods shown have problems associated with them some suggest hanging the langstroth hive perpendicular to its normal position so if that were a frame per perpendicular would change the cell orientation and the cell angle as well so i don't like that myself and uh, to his normal, using an adapter to which the Langstroth frame is attached with screws. Dr. Leo S., which is Dr. Leo Sharashkin at HorizontalHive.com, he suggests cutting the Langstroth frame so that it will fit into the lens frame to be held in place with screws. So that's true. Dr. Leo takes a wooden frame, Langstroth frame, cuts the shoulders off of it, slides it up inside the lens frame, which is deeper, and then runs screws to the top and attaches them there. And it has to be with screws because the way the lands frames are, they butt right up against each other. There's no space between them. So you can't like zip tie it on or wire it on or something like that because now you create a gap in between the top bar of those frames and that is uh, part of the inner cover for a lands hive. So you can't do that. And he does a great video where he demonstrates how to do that. And uh, let's see, <clears throat> cutting lens straws so that fit into the lens and to be held in place with screws. I'm not sold on either of these ideas, so I'm wondering if you have a suggestion. Thank you in advance. You're not gonna like my suggestion, so. I only have one lens hive. I have the long Langstroth hive, which I really like. It's compatible with everything. We don't have this issue. So the first question you have to ask is, why do we need to transfer the frames from the Langstroth standard hives to the lands hive at all. I realize that that makes it easy if you wanna transfer your existing bees, one into the other hive. That's probably what the goal is here. Very difficult challenge because to make these modifications with bees on the frames can be difficult. Um, but my recommendation is always just to get the lands frames, put the lands frames in. If you wanna boost the bees, we put those uh, 
foundation, the wax foundation that Dr. Leo sells uh, comes from Spain, I believe, in an area where they're all organic farming. And so the, the thinking is that there's no concentration of pesticides in that wax. And the bees draw those out pretty well. They definitely did it in my lay-ins hive. Um, here's what, uh, it's just, it's hard. If you want to pull the frames from that Langstroth hive and put the frames into a lay-ins hive, you're actually going to have to do one of the proven modifications. And of the two that you mentioned, the one that I personally would recommend would be uh, Dr. Leo's method because it keeps the cell orientation the same. Uh, structurally, 13 degree angle, every part of it. So that is probably the least disruptive to the bees. Although I saw him do that on Doug and Stacy. I'm sorry if I got that wrong, their channel, which is a homesteading channel. And uh, I don't think it went very well overall with those uh, horizontal hives at that location uh, when he did the transfer like that. So um, your pickle is getting your bees out of the one hive and into another. So I, you know, that's the challenge. If you're not willing to transfer the frames themselves, now we have to get bees out of a hive and into another hive when they're well established. So you could hope to take the queen out of that hive. This is hard because the bees are, are going to be reluctant to leave because your queen is going, well, actually, See, I'm brainstorming this while I'm thinking about it. If I were facing this challenge and I really had to get the bees out, I think uh, I would cage my queen in the Langstroth hive so that we would create a brood break, which we've talked about before. So you could probably look at the last video to see how we did that. I posted the procedure. In fact, I'm going to put the procedure for the brood break on my website fredsfindfowl.com or the way to be.org and uh, it'll be on the page marked horizontal hives so here's what we can do you can cage the queen caging the queen means that she'll stop laying of course in the rest of the brood frames in that hive and she will only be able to lay in the frame that's under the cage so the cage is like this. I realize this is a lot of work. This is something you may not want to do. Time is of the essence, it says here. But if we put our, or if we find, it's better if you even, if you find the queen on a frame of brood, put this cage over that frame, put that frame up against your eastern side or the closest to the southeastern side of your hive, depending on how your configuration is. So now she's trapped in here. All the worker bees can still attend to her. The rest of your frames, if it's a 10 frame box, there'll be nine frames out here. And we need to keep that queen in there for at least 14 days while all that brood gets cycled through. And then, see, I'll tell you what I'm getting to. It's because if we just grab the queen out of there and we put her in this lay-ins hive, and we put the lay-ins hive in the exact same position, this is the other key, the lay-ins hive will have to be in the exact same position that your current Langstroth hive is that we're going to transfer from. So what happens is while she's caged, the rest of your colony goes broodless. And then, so you can keep her in there for a full 21 days if you want to make sure that everything is smooth and easy to do. Now they're all broodless. This opens up a window of opportunity on several levels. One, now we can take the queen out and she has to still be in a cage. So now we have to transfer into another style of queen cage. Oh look, it just happened to have one. So you're gonna have to put her in something like this. We're gonna take the queen from the current hive and now it's broodless. We pulled the frame that she was on. We're getting rid of that, we're gonna freeze it. It's full of varroa mites now anyway. We're gonna put the queen in here and we're also gonna treat uh, that colony with uh, oxalic acid vaporization. Me personally, you don't have to if you're treatment free, don't do that. But that's what I would do because now I have 96% efficacy on all those phoretic mites that are out. So the queen's in here. She goes into your lay-ins hive, right on one of the frames with foundation. Probably let's say the second frame in from the end, the southeast end of your hive. 
And now we get a handful of bees, nurse bees, whatever. We shake them into your land's hive. They're with the queen. She can't fly out. And then we go to every single frame in your hive and we shake those bees out into your land's hive. This is just a recommendation. It's not an absolute. I'm just giving you one method to solve this problem. So now the queen's in there and then you have displaced the other hive because you put your new land's hive exactly in its spot with the entrance as close to the location of the original entrance of the other hive as possible. Now bring the other hive physically right up next to it. Side by side entrances if you can. Now the one with the queen in it, these guys will smell that pheromone and they will start to go in there. The bees inside the original colony that lost their queen just now because of you, they will be searching for their queen. They'll be searching for the pheromone. If they find that pheromone of their queen right next door and their Nezinoff glands go nuts and they start spreading that pheromone everywhere, they will abandon for the most part their original hive and go right in. Any stragglers, because there's no more brood for them to cling to, you can shake those into your new lands hive if you want. Best results for me have always been to let them walk in. And then you can leave this queen in there in this cage for several days until they start to make an investment there. And every part of that original hive has to disappear, it has to leave. That's when you get rid of it, whoever you're passing the equipment on to or whatever. And the new hive is in its place. So the foragers that come and go, it's all familiar except for the entrance has changed and the, the shape of their hive has changed. And see if that works. Now that would be an experiment. But based on honeybee biology, I think it could work. And then you release the queen and she has nowhere to go except for that hive as well. And in the meantime, when you're doing all that transferring and you're looking at all those frames, if there were any supersedure cells or anything like that in there, you definitely want to smush those. We don't want any swarming going on. That's one of probably many methods for making that transfer. If you don't want to pull or modify frames from your Langstroth hive to fit the Lance hive. Moving on, question number four comes from Bryce. Just over three weeks ago, I spotted a swarm above my apiary about 50 feet up. I was curious about temp queen, and I attached a queen temp noodle to the outside of the swarm box and hung it up about 15 feet. There was no interest by the swarm, and higher to the next bivy they went. This time, maybe 90 feet up. And after another hour or so, off across the swamp they went. I left the noodle baited swarm box up for a couple of weeks and I checked it whenever I was out in my apiary and saw no interest. I removed the noodle and replaced the swarm box to a spot and I caught a swarm three weeks before and had recently seen scouts checking on another box. The next day, there were bees on the noodle box right where I had the temp queen noodle attached. Although it was no longer there. Anyway, the bees were checking out the inside, but the fifth size cluster remained on the outside, right on the screw hook. Anyway, I had this on for days, and I believe the bees were exhibiting K-wing posture, which by the way, the K-wing posture that uh, I mentioned for queenless colonies and things like that, we probably should change the terminology. Uh, because when bees are excited and uh, they're without a queen, you frequently see a lot of spread wing posture. K wing is a little different. And the reason I bring this up is because someone else mentioned, isn't K wing actually like a K? So they have like, you see a split of two different sets of wings apart like that on the back of the bee, instead of just the wings together spread apart, which is almost, which is a healthy bee that just has an attitude. Where K-wing, when you see them split apart, you'll see like some wings at an angle off to themselves. And like the bee, when it goes to close its wings, they don't close because that's a sick bee. So we should change that terminology to spread wing, I think, rather than call it K-wing. Because technically, they're not injured or ill. They're just excited, animated, and upset. So if they had a spread wing, anyway, they're looking for their queen. They've lost their queen. They don't know what's going on. But this is what I want to uh, get into. And it says temp queen lasts on items set at contacts and 
Can it be washed off? Um, that stuff has some lasting power, by the way, and it's called QMP, which is queen mandibular pheromone. It's a synthetic, sold under the name Temp Queen. And the last time we talked about this, a bunch of people apparently went to Better Be and ordered a bunch of it because it went out of stock immediately. And I learned my lesson because I should have stocked up on it before I mentioned it. Now I have stocked up on it, so I'm going to mention it is back in stock. But what I want, to, want you to understand is this is not a swarm trap lure. There's lots of uses for it. It's a lot of fun to have, and it has lasting power. People have said, how long does it last? Well, um, I had a bunch of it that's several weeks old that I used to collect pseudo swarms. In other words, you're replacing a queen. So let's backtrack. The reason that I tested it in the first place and wanted to use it was I wanted to direct the bees where to bivouac. A bivouac is different from a final destination where there's a cavity that they hope to inhabit. The bivouac allows the bees to cluster temporarily. They gather around queens, and that's why sometimes when you see several little clusters of bees on tree branches, same tree, several swarms at the same time, they all split up, there'll be a queen in the center of every little cluster. And recently we've been pulling apart the little tiny clusters that we see by themselves, found a queen every single time. So those are, their pheromone is, is weaker. So the queens that are mated, that are flying out in a prime swarm, we would call that, with a large bundle of bees. Bees are opportunistic and they follow pheromones even if it's not their own queen. I'm learning so much because of the synthetic pheromone use. But the reason I wanted to talk about it uh, with this question in particular is, please do not put temp queen or QMP, the queen mandibular pheromone, synthetic little, and he says noodle here, they're little light green noodles. Um, and wherever you put them, they leave a residue as if an actual queen had been there and they draw the attention of random foraging bees. And uh, because as I started to mention, I had old used up, what I thought was used up QMP, left it on the railing in my way to bee building and the following morning, I went out there and the whole rail was covered in bees. The handrail was covered in bees. The vertical was covered in bees. And then I thought, that's weird. There's no queen there. And where did all these bees come from? They're obviously not loyal to their own colony when they smell this pheromone. So they thought it was a bivouac. They thought it was a swarm on the go. That's my guess. I don't know what bees really think. And then, of course, they landed and clustered on it. And the more of them that landed on it, do you know what they were doing? Licking this little synthetic pheromone, raising their abdomens, and spreading it through their nasonoff gland, just as if it were their actual queen. And then they're drawing other bees to that. So now that just turned me on to another potential tool, another use for it. And you might be sitting there thinking, what are you talking about? What is this stuff even for? Well, it's for... A situation when you find a colony where you've lost your queen and you need a placeholder to make them think there is a queen. So you put it in an established hive. That's what it's for as a placeholder to keep nurse bees active and doing nurse bee things, to keep them provisioning the hive as if there were a queen there that was about to lay eggs. So it, it momentarily stimulates them to think that there's a bee queen and it prevents the worker bees from activating their ovaries and becoming laying workers. That's the purpose of it. It's a placeholder inside a hive. I just happened to play around with it and found a lot of other uses. So what I was thinking about doing personally is that, so anyway, it doesn't work as a bait hive because what happens here is exactly what was described. Uh, they will cluster wherever that pheromone is they're not bringing their own queen with them to that final destination. Because if a queen exists in this hive, because that's what you're telling them with a pheromone, and their pheromone communication is the strongest thing that the bees have as far as their senses go, then they won't move into that with their queen because it's telling them that there's another queen there. So what we have are bees that have jumped ship. You know, they've decided they want to go with that queen even though she's synthetic. And so they cluster. They don't move in if they have a queen with them and they stay on the front. 
take the noodle away, they'll be there for a few more days, but then they'll disperse and they'll go back to their original colonies, wherever they are. Don't feel bad for them. They're traitors. They left their people. So here's what occurred to me. Sometimes we'll get another queen and we want to raise the queen and we want to have a package of bees. Package bees are notoriously not great. <laughs> the bees that they're sending with the queen in the package. What if you could make your own package? This is the light bulb moment uh, when I saw all those bees on the railing. Um, you have to have a remote apiary to make this happen. When I picked up the QMP noodles that were laying on that railing, all of those bees on that railing wanted to follow her. So if you pick it up on your hand, you're going to have a baseball mitt sized collection of bees right there. So it occurs to me. I can take that noodle and I can use it to get those bees because there's no queen in the hive. They'll go anywhere she is. I can put that noodle inside a box or I can vacuum them up if I want to use my Colorado bee vac or something like that. And now I've got a couple of pounds of bees. Now, will this work if you have no bees and you're just in your backyard and uh, you decide, hey, I want to collect a bunch of bees and start my own bees and, and then I'll just order in a queen and install a queen with these guys. Will that work? Not, I don't think it will. And the reason is I'm in proximity to more than 20 colonies of bees right there. So I have a much better opportunity to harvest random foragers that just decide on a whim to follow this pheromone. So, but when they collect together and I put them in a box that they can't get out of, and I use the QMP on a screen. The number eight screen is my favorite. And uh, I hold the QMP on there because once the bees are in there and I've locked them up, they've got a screen for ventilation, but they can't come and go anymore. They're captives. I remove the QMP. Now they'll be upset. Now they'll do the spread wing posture. Where did she go? She's gone. And I have to take that box of bees miles away. So I have an opportunity now because I have... My son lives 15 minutes away and he has bees in his backyard, thanks to me. His neighbor has taken up beekeeping, thanks to me. And so I have a satellite location that I could temporarily put them there. And then I bring the queen that I've hatched out because I put queens in a uh, queen mating nucleus because I found a queen in one of those little tiny doomed uh, clusters. And I put her in a mating nucleus because she's not mated. And then I gave her time to mate and return and start producing eggs on those little tiny frames. And so she's got eggs there. But now I have to put her in a full-size colony. Aha! I used QMP, also called Temp Queen, to get these random bees in there. And now I can take that queen and install her in that package, which I made just by collecting through pheromones my own assemblage of bees that think they're on the fly and they're traveling to another location with some queen they've never met. They just like the way she smelled and decided to join up. What do you think about that? So if you live right next to, I don't know if this is theft, if you live right next to a big apiary or something and you put QMP on a tree branch or something, it's going to draw a pile of bees. Uh, you could test it, but you probably need to give them back because if those aren't your bees, I don't know if you want to get into some kind of range war with a beekeeper that's commercial, but that stuff works for a lot of things that are just plain fun. That's the end of question number four. Moving on to question number five. It's not a lure. Go back to Swarm Commander or something like that if you want to lure scout bees into a hive cavity. Lemongrass oil, that works too. Next question is from Thomas. And it says, I just received some really nice foundation from Premier Bee Products. I purchased both medium and deep foundation in black with extra heavy wax for brood. My questions are regarding foundation for supers. In the past, I've used natural waxed right cell from Man Lake. What color do you think is best? First of all, Premier is going to perform way better than the Man Lake frames. I've tested both and there's a big difference. Uh, so white, yellow, what about wax, regular or heavy? Always heavy wax. If they offer heavy wax coating on any frame that you're buying, no matter who makes it or what it is, the more beeswax that's on it, the better. Bees use it faster, draw it out quicker, and they're attracted to it more. 
So the next thing is color, and it says here, I'm thinking of getting yellow foundation, natural color, with extra heavy wax, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. Well, my thoughts are, yellow foundation, I know it looks good. I did not know that uh, Premier offers uh, yellow foundation, but most of what I've seen from them is black, and they're the inserts, but uh, black, in my opinion, is better. And that's because the number one thing that we're looking for when we're quickly canvassing a hive to see if there's a queen in there, we want to see those eggs. If you have white foundation or you've got this golden colored foundation that's supposed to be the color of honey or whatever, um, <laughs> this is the yellow stuff. So, and by the way, this is a Man Lake frame, I believe. It's not even labeled on the top, and it is heavy wax coated. My bees don't like it. It's brittle. You can tell how brittle it just even by the sound. Hear that? This stuff is pretty brittle, so I did heat testing on it, and it sagged fast. This is compared to Acorn Heavy Wax. Listen to it. Hear the difference? Very brittle. All right, so that light color, uh, when the eggs are on it, very difficult to see. Black, much better. So my personal preference is black over white or the honey colored frames. And uh, that's it, purely because of uh, being able to see larvae and uh, eggs when they're very tiny so it just helps you out but if you have no problem seeing those because light's not passing through them uh your your eggs and stuff are going to blend right in there so that's why i choose black bees don't care they don't care about the color everything inside the hive you have to consider uh would be in darkness so the bees aren't seeing color anyway so next is question number six comes from michael many bees are coming in with thin pollen legs Please, do you know if these are nectar gatherers? Do they, they do not seem to be putting honey in the rearmost cells of the flow hive, but there is a wall-to-wall -wall bee situation on the sides. I feel optimistic. The Varroa have been eradicated from July 16th to the 21st. I'm so pleased with that. I see no Varroa drop in two weeks. I'll be vigilant and looking at any that may come in. Okay, how do you know if the bees coming in on the landing board even are collecting pollen alone or pollen and nectar and if they're loaded or not. How do you know? We look at their abdomens because there's a honey crop. So we have the head, thorax, abdomen. The abdomen is, is divided up into chambers. So we have what's called a proventricula. So there's a first chamber that is your what some people call the honey stomach it's really a crop there's digestion is not really happening in there and then there's a proventricula which is a valve that closes that keeps it from going into digestion so the more loaded they get the more extended their abdomen comes out so if it's truncated if it's if it's shorter than the length of their wings for example that bee is not bringing in anything what could they be bringing in that would be fluid-based that would uh, fill their abdomen? Honey or water. So, and uh, they also get nectar from the plants, but when they're outgoing, sometimes you'll see them loaded up on honey ahead of time for their extended flight and the work that they're gonna do. Bees that are going to swarm, fill up on all the honey resources inside, so their abdomens are really distended. So, you know, their abdomen's in joints. And then as they extend, the joints slide and uh, those plates slide. And that extends it to let you know that they're loaded or not. So when you see them coming in, they'll fly heavy too. And uh, you can tell by looking at them if they're bringing in a lot of nectar or not. Now, depending on what's going on, super hot days right now. What are bees doing? They're fanning in there. They're trying to keep things cool. A lot of bees are bringing in water. Water is from the senior bees in your hive. So they don't do water and nectar on the same flight, but they likely do pollen and nectar at the same time on the same flight. Uh, but they're using a lot of their resources to stay cool. 
because it's, they're using a lot of energy. They need carbohydrates to do that. The carbohydrate is the sucrose that they've gathered. So that's why you might see a lot of their resources being consumed even when they're bringing in a lot. And that's because super hot days, they're keeping things cool, they're burning resources. Most people think of the bees burning up their resources in the wintertime in a state of torpor to kind of keep that cluster warm. And that's true, but they're also burning a lot of resources on these really hot days. That's why if you happen to be in an area like where I am right now in the low 80s, that's actually pretty optimum for the bees because they have to do very little cooling down because remember the brood frames are at 94 to 97 degrees on the brood itself. So they're not having to do much to warm that and they're also preserving some humidity in there. And that's also why on really hot days, you might be taxing your bees if you're also venting through the top of your hive because now they have to bring in more moisture because what's venting through the top? Humidity. They need humidity for the brood in the brood section. So that means you have to have more watering bees in there, more moisture in there to keep up with it, and there goes some moisture out the top. So as I mentioned earlier on today, if you have fresh water sources for your bees, you don't need that top vent in your hive because they're going to provide humidity, warmth, or cooling as needed right through the main entrance of the hive. That's my thinking. And uh, so, and people ask this question a lot. I'm wondering how long it will take to fill the seven flow frames and uh, so on. So this again is seasonal. My flow frames here don't fill until uh, we get into August. And that's when real heavy nectar flows start coming in. And that's also where what happens that time of year the numbers of bees are really high. Although this year, they're all ahead. I have not put flow supers on yet, but given the inspections that I've done recently, and I'm in Northwest Pennsylvania, uh, the weather this year has caused my bees to really produce a lot of other bees. So they're also storing a lot of honey and uh, they're just expanding at a rate that I don't personally like because I'm trying to hold them back. And uh, it's not working. So I will probably be putting on the supers, my flow supers early this year, just because I need space for them to do things. Those who looked at my recent Lance Hive inspection video, um, we added two or three frames to that. And uh, we had checkerboarded frames earlier on. So I had foundationless and foundation, which is the heavy wax from Dr. Leo. And uh, they've drawn out the new comb, they've drawn out the foundation, and uh, they're almost out of space. I'm really counting on them to draw back on their own, I hope, because there's too many bees, there's too much productivity going on, and uh, I'm out of space. The colony holds, uh, the hive holds 20 frames, lands frames, and I expect uh, within the next three weeks those frames will be full of honey, which, uh, yeah, that's a whole nother thing. I've talked about incompatibility and how challenging it is to use lands when you have a Langstroth setup. I have a Langstroth extractor. Those of you who have not bought an extractor yet and you're thinking about one, there are hand crank extractors and there are motorized extractors. I had the hand crank extractor for many years, 15 years, before I switched over to a powered one. So having an electric motor on your extractor is a huge advantage. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this now, if you haven't bought one, you're in good shape. If you're kind of straddling Langstroth or Lance, because the frames are different sizes. So if you go to Horizontal B, HorizontalHive.com, Horizontal Bees is a whole different thing. HorizontalHive.com, Dr. Leo's website, they have an extractor that's sized for lands frames. The good news is, if you got that extractor, it also accepts Langstroth frames, mediums, deeps, and shallows. So it's an all-purpose tool, where if we already have Langstroth equipment, it does not accept the larger uh, lands uh, frames. So if I were shopping right now, I bought that power extractor two or three years ago. 
It's just fantastic. But if I thought ahead, I should have just bought the larger extractor and it would fit all frames from all hives. So I'm passing it on to you. That was my duh moment there. Question number seven comes from Kevin. Let's see, I made a long lang that is equivalent to a deep and medium in depth, and I left three in on the bottom. The hive is 20 frames and is packed. I've noticed, as you stated, that the bottom three is packed with drone brood. During my inspection, they weren't too happy with me, but I was nervous and wanted to do a mite count. I couldn't find a queen and took a chance using the Dawn dish soap method, and I got zero mites. I've been developed, let's see, I have been using Scanner B Pro all season and had zero mite count, and I didn't think that was possible, and I noticed a fully developed and capped supersedure cell, and I just left it alone. I have all stages of brood and think I saw eggs. She is a first year queen, so my first question is, do I cut out the supersedure cell or let the bees decide? Um... Based on the description, the hive is full. So there's a risk if there are also resources outside coming into that hive that uh, they could be making preparations to leave. And the fact that you have a supersedure cell, a supersedure cell, for those who don't know, is just a queen cell that shows up in the middle of the field generally, the field of brood comb. And it's made from a normal worker cell originally, comes out from the face and then points down. Um, if they've already done that, then uh, it sounds like they wouldn't do that uh, if the queen was good or if the queen was present. So they make supersedure cells when the queen is either on her way out or she's gone. They needed an egg to do it. That's why they chose an egg that was in a worker cell because that's an emergency. Another name for it would be an emergency cell. Supersedure uh, could mean that they're unhappy with the queen. Her productivity is low. She might still be around. She might be sick or injured. An emergency cell, which comes also out of a worker cell, is when the queen suddenly dies. The inspector went in there and pulled up a frame right from the middle and rolled that queen between the frames and killed her, damaged her abdomen, and made her non-productive again, and the bees tossed her out. So either way, we have an emergency situation. They grabbed an available egg. They built a cell around it, and they're going to have a queen to replace her. So I think that uh, you've already lost the queen, or she's... You know, departure is imminent. So, uh, I would leave that emergency cell there. Or you can take a second check and try to locate the queen. If you find her, um, my favorite thing is to set up a nucleus hive and set her up with a frame of brood, maybe two, and uh, see if uh, she's still good to go. If her patterns are good, what the brood, what do the brood look like in your hive to begin with? Did everything look in order? Is the brood pattern good? Is everything else healthy otherwise? Um, something may have happened to her. She may have just, may just be gone. So if it can't find the queen, I definitely don't want to take away the insurance policy, which is their emergency B. The other thing it said here is, uh, let's see. Is it possible to have zero mites across five colonies? Anything is possible in beekeeping. That would be a cause for celebration for most people. It makes me think of Bob Binney. Um, if you don't know, he's a big commercial beekeeper. Thousands of beehives. And he partners with universities to do studies. A lot of the studies are related to varroa mite uh, control measures. And they went to one of his uh, out yards, one of his large apiaries and uh, could not find a mite to study mites. So is it possible? Yeah. The more isolated you are, the better chances you have. That's why uh, it's a good situation to be in, but just because you can't find the mites doesn't mean none of them are there. It just means the numbers are extremely low. Very rare these days to find a hive anywhere without a mite in it. And it only takes one to reproduce and make hundreds eventually. But those numbers are great. I would love it if I couldn't find any mites in my hives. Question number eight comes from Michael. Says, am I right? You always work a deep and a half Langstroth all season. Is there enough room all season with that method for the queen to lay? It's taking a lot of time. I'm patient. Seeing the bees still working. The flow hive 
Top Honey Super. I got a nuke, which is a nucleus colony with plenty of Varroa. What? I got a nuke with plenty of Varroa? 600 plus? Oh my gosh. That's terrible. Um... I don't know, a nucleus hive. That's a, you're talking five frames usually, sometimes four with 600 Varroa. That's, I've never seen anything like that. Anyway, but to answer this other question here. Um, do, 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 do. No, um, this comes from Dr. Thomas Seeley's Darwinian Beekeeping. And uh, not everyone can keep bees this way. So I'm going to warn you about that right now. If you're trying to collect a bunch of honey, this is not the method. Uh, what I do is, and its configuration is single deep, keeping colonies small, allowing them to swarm. They're natural brood breaks. So basically, uh, Dr. Seeley is replicating what happens in feral colonies of bees. Feral colonies of bees exist all over the place. And uh, this is something that people have question marks over their heads about because nobody's treating those colonies. Nobody's inspecting them. Uh, why do they exist? Often in the same tree for years and years and years. They're not the same queen, obviously, but they go through cycles of increasing in number, swarming out and replacing. And then, of course, you might think, well, then does that mean that the comb in those hives is also like 10 years old, 15 years old? That would be toxic because we know that the beeswax in the comb concentrates the environmental uh, hazards that we have associated with modern agriculture. So it concentrates uh, pesticides, which are herbicides, sometimes insecticides and everything else build up in the comb. So then what happens if that colony died out, then uh, wax moths get in there, small eye beetles slime out the resources, wax moths eat all of their old honeycomb. And so it recycles and then a swarm would find that cavity. It would smell great because it would have propolis in it and it would have old comb remnants and all this detritus on the bottom that was left over from previous colonies. And now they fly in and move in and create new beeswax, clean out the bottom, haul everything out of there, new colony of bees. So that's Darwinian beekeeping, letting the bees kind of keep house on their own and cycle themselves out as they will. The result is uh, bees reproduce more often as a superorganism, so more colonies are made. This is why bees, by the way, um, high swarm bees, like bees with a high propensity to swarm, spread their genetics faster, spread colonies faster. That's why we kind of have the problem with the uh, Africanized bees. One of their traits is that they're super swarmy, that they swarm frequently. They build up and even small colonies of Africanized bees, well, take off and split. So smaller colonies, more rapid reproduction, healthier colony environment overall. So do I do that exclusively? No. So, so if you've seen my Layens hive, um, it's just loaded. The horizontal, the long Langstroth hive, super loaded. Um, the closest thing to it would be the other hives that I have where they're single deep and a medium. And of course, all of the observation hives, the largest observation hive only has nine deep frames in it. So it's the equivalent of, uh, it's right between an eight or a 10 frame single deep hive. And then uh, there will be no control on that. They'll raise, they'll get their numbers up, they'll build their resources, and they likely will swarm, hopefully not just before winter. And again, not everyone can do this because the environment where you live. Uh, you need to find out if the environment, if the wilds in the area where you live can sustain all those extra swarms of bees, if they're going to be healthy, if you're living in urban America, you have neighbors all over the place, uh, that may not work out for you. So your goal then would be to control as many swarms as you can. But uh, the premise is the smaller hives do better. Um, and uh, it's actually proved out. So Next winter, they will be down to my maximum sized hive going into winter, other than the horizontal hives, so the Langstroth designs. The maximum size will have a deep and two mediums. Uh, most of them will go through a deep and a medium. The smallest colonies that went through winter last year were single deep 10 frame boxes. Those that did the best left to themselves 
with only 10 deep frames, which included brood, resources, and everything else unfed, were the 5 over 5 nucleus boxes. They're made out of wood, 5 frames on the bottom, 5 on top. They have insulation caps on them. The bottom box completely uninsulated, so it's only 3 quarter inch pine. Small entrances, that's another part of it, easy to defend. And uh, they came through, you can't kill those bees. I know I say that, you could, in theory, kill your bees, but I ignore them, robbed their resources, took their brood, uh, used them to fortify other colonies all the time, and even today, uh, in the opening today, the, the entrance that was shown was one of the um, little nucleus hives that I just have banked as resource colonies. They're not fed, they're not supported, so Dr. Seeley, <clears throat> no great surprise, the man's a, a bee genius. He's a genius of entomology and studies of animal behavior, insect behavior, and uh, definitely has decoded honeybees. And uh, so his method is for a sustainable um, bee culture. Now, that is not sustainable for you if you're a commercial beekeeper if you're trying to make a lot of money off of the honey that you're going to get, and if you want to be able to go to your next bee meeting and say, I have a single hive and I got 250 pounds of honey off of it, well, you're not going to be one of the Darwinian beekeepers. So I have never had a hive generate 200 pounds of honey. So, um, so is it true that I practice just that? No, there'll be extras on there because I do experiments and evaluations as well. And this year, one of the experiments I'm doing, I have, uh, we're doing a lot of shallow supering uh, because we're going to get cut comb from that. And I also have the Cirocell companies, um, they're Ross rounds, but they're, instead of the Ross round as a standard, looks like a shallow super. This is the double Ross round box so it fits in a standard Langstroth deep box and they have double Ross round frames those are in progress right now so I violated my you know box and a half limiting the size so sometimes because I evaluate other equipment I do let the bees build up and I do add extra boxes so same thing with the flow hives for example they are single deeps there's a medium super the medium super gets full of honey first that provides the honey bridge that the queen does not tend to walk across. That's how I get away with not having queen excluders. And then I put the flow super on top of that. And I'm actually behind because this year the bees are ahead. And uh, those supers are now full and they need to be expanded. So I either have to super with other medium frames or I need to put those flow supers on. So I hope that explains that. So no, I'm not strictly to that. I imagine uh, Dr. Seeley in his apiary or bees under his management, you would see a single deep and a medium and nothing else year round. But I'm not adhering to that. But the results have been very good. Small box wintering. Question number nine comes from Preston in Pickens, South Carolina. I knew a guy from Pickens, South Carolina. Anyway. Uh, what do you think about clove oil instead of smoke as a tool in hive management? Okay, clove oil, this is interesting. Um, essential oils are of interest to people because it appeals to our holistic uh, approach to beekeeping. You know, if you're trying to be as you know, soft on the bees, you want the stuff that you put in your hives to uh, be from the environment, trees uh, and plants of all kinds generate essential oils. Uh, they do that uh, to improve the plant, of course, but also to defend it against pests and things that would forage on them. So clove oil is one of 150 different essential oils that have been looked at as a method for varroa mite control, actually. So the reason I want to mention that is it sounds good on the face of it that you would use something that might have an impact on varroa destructor mites and at the same time be replacing smoking your bees when you do an inspection. So on really hot, dry days, um, I switch back and forth depending on the size of the colony, what their disposition is. Um, I use sugar syrup, one-to-one -one sugar syrup. 
And uh, what I put in it is I use Honey Bee Healthy. That's what this stuff is. Very common. Everybody's heard of it. And uh, I use that essential oil in the sugar syrup for a couple of reasons. One, I mix up my sugar sprayers for that uh, at the beginning of the year and the sugar lasts all year. The sugar syrup would start to develop mold on its own by adding essential oils to it. And in this case, Honey Bee Healthy, um, it extends the syrup and provides a scent that the bees recognize. And so when you're inspecting a colony and you spritz a little bit on there, then uh, the bees come up and they're licking it right away. Not only that, the bottle smells like it. So when you open it ahead of time and before you spritz them to look at their disposition, as soon as they smell that, they're coming up with their tongues out. So their proboscis flipped forward and they're just waiting for it. They know the smell. Uh, and if we smell it at all, the bees have smelled it ahead of us. So I use that because I like to spritz them a little bit and occupy them that way while I'm doing the inspection instead of smoke. Smoke negatively impacts the bees. To what extent? We don't even know. So we know it stops them from producing honey, which stops them from working. So where a little sugar syrup, when you go into a hive, spritzed around, uh, does not. Another thing that people get concerned about, won't they kick off robbing? Won't the rest of them smell honey be healthy and the sugar syrup and come flying? No, because you go around your apiary and you spritz every entrance with it. So that gets them all happy that you just visited the apiary. So that works. And so I wanted to explain that because that's what I use it for. And uh, it preserves the syrup. And it can also help when it comes time to introduce queens. It's one of the studies that was done that honeybee healthy in sugar syrup, spraying a colony, for example, you have laying workers. Uh, laying workers are a challenge for a lot of people because they'll resist or even attack and kill a newly introduced queen uh, when we have a laying worker situation because the queen's been replaced by those females that have activated their ovaries and they've started laying drones, drone eggs. So, but if you spritz them all heavy with Honey Bee Healthy, and that dose is two teaspoons per quart, and it's all on the bottle here, that stuff works. And then you spritz the, uh, the little cage that your queen comes in. Usually it's a wooden cage, something like this. Spritz that with Honey Bee Healthy 2 and sugar syrup all over it. When you put that in, when you're trying to introduce a new queen, and they're all just happy to see the queen, and then eventually her pheromone comes through, and they'll let her out and you'll be good to go. So it helps with queen introduction as well. Now the thing with the uh, clove uh, oil. First of all, the oils, the essential oils that you buy uh, don't liquefy. In other words, they don't uh, mix with water or syrup readily. So you need something like lecithin or whatever so that you can break it down so it'll be in suspension so it won't just be on top. I have zero experience with clove oil. I know it comes up because it was part of a study that proved it had efficacy against varroa destructor mites. And I know a lot of people are, what? It kills varroa mites? Yeah, 0.75 grams of clove oil killed 96% varroa mites. So a bunch of people are like, yeah, I want to get clove oil and I'm going to use it and I'm going to kill varroa mites. We always have to slow down when we hear about a new something that might kill varroa mites. Always slow down, look at studies, and I will tell you when it comes to clove oil, you need more study. I'm going to link a study that was done with it, and uh, if it does dissolve into your sugar syrup, or if you're using that with water, sugar syrup is better because it, it occupies the bees and it rewards the bees for your visit, where the essential oil by itself would not be providing that reward and on higher levels, of course, can damage the bee's microbiome. So their midgut can be damaged. So all of these things need to be very carefully considered before you use something else. Um, things like Pro Health, Honey Bee Healthy, Beekeeper's Choice. Those are all things that have been out for a long time. They've been in use. Um, and all they do is stimulate your bees to feed or extend your sugar syrup and keep it from spoiling. But I'll link the study for those who want to know from question nine. It will be down there in the video description and you can go read about it yourself. 
but the, the summation is that, hey, more studies needed. It seemed to work, but it's the parameters for how it worked are very specific, as always when it comes to a scientific method. Question number 10. This comes from Marvin in Illinois. I have a very strong hive that I placed a hog half comb in. But after two months, the bees have never built any comb. I saw them looking the space over, but never saw any new comb. Did I take the hog half? Did I take the half comb off too soon? I think what's meant is a hog half. So it says half comb, but usually it's hog half for comb honey. Um, and then uh, it says, is there anything I can do to get the bees to start building comb? No, there isn't. Other than, now I did this in the past myself. I have a video on uh, Ross Rounds, which I'll let you look at. I'll put that link down in the video description at all, as well. And the thing is, because I was making a video and I had a timeline and I wanted to get that stuff out, I put uh, Ross Round frames. It comes as a whole unit. The Ross Rounds, the frame, and it's got these... Um, spring clips that go in it, that space and uh, the access that the bees have to it has all been worked out very carefully. So it's it looks haphazard, like it wasn't thoughtfully engineered, but it actually is through lots of trial and error. They arrived at that configuration so the bees would work those. Ross rounds in my case, hog halves are part of that too. Um, that they've worked out when you get the systems, if you buy the box that comes with it and the whole kit, you're way ahead. So anyway, I pulled it off. I got, you know, two thirds of it. They were finished and uh, they looked really good. It's like magic because they're building it in these, if they're hog halves, they're building it in the container. It's all ready to go and uh, very little interaction on the part of the beekeeper. Now, if I had waited, because I pulled the one off for the video, if I had waited another 13 days, all of the others were completed. Perfect. Every one of them. So it matters what time of year. If I'd done that in spring, I wouldn't have had it. So in spring, we're letting the bees build up. We're getting their resources stored. They're getting everything they need for winter. And that for me, at the end of July, is when I put on the fun stuff. So that's when we would be putting on the supers, Ross rounds, hog halves, uh, however you like, if you're doing cut comb, things like that, flow hives, flow supers. And then this is just where I live. Your periods of uh, resources may be different where you are. How do you find out? You go to bscape.org if you're in the United States. You put in your address and you see if you have a dearth. And obviously when you have a dearth, your bees are in decline. When you have a nectar flow, your bees are building up and getting ready for winter. Now, the other part of this is we talked about sugar syrup and things like that and feeding bees or using essential oils. You don't want to do that on colonies where you're hoping to draw consumable products like honey or cut comb or hog halves or Ross rounds. My favorite of all of those, by the way, the Ross rounds cut comb. I'm doing this year too. Um, but uh, you don't want to risk tainting the honey. Now, if you're just using a sprayer with sugar syrup on it and you're using that instead of smoke to inspect your colony, spritz, 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 the bees consume that right away. It's not like they're running off to store it in uh, the cells and you're just spritzing. You're not providing half a gallon or a quart or some kind of hive entrance feeder or some rapid round feeder on top. So it's very limited. Um, but there should be no feeding going on when you're putting that stuff on for your consumer products. So my advice is leave it on. They'll do it. They'll still build. They'll fill it. Have faith. Watch your bees. Put on strong colonies. They're good. Question number 11 comes from Marla, Marvin in Nauvoo, Nauvoo, Illinois. I have a hive that is in a field next to a wooded area. And when I open up the hive for inspection, I find that there are lots of ants with eggs and larvae. Are ants a problem for a beehive? What do I do to get rid of ants? Ants are a lot of different species. We're talking about Illinois. I don't think you have a problem. Um, many years ago, I was out watching my bees 
and I saw a line of ants going up the side of one of the beehives, and they were going right in the back and the top, and they were on the inner cover. And uh, I also saw that they were carrying little white eggs with them. And the first thought that I had was, man, these bees are taking bee eggs out of there, and why aren't the bees stopping them? Well, it turned out they were just ant eggs. Ants have a way of migrating their eggs around with them when they go somewhere. And uh, if you really want to get rid of them, I've heard of people using dry powdered sugar, not sugar, dry powdered cinnamon up on top of the inner cover, things like that. I've not personally done that. Uh, are they damaging to the bees? 99% of the time, no. So you need to look at them and see kind of what's going on. Uh, some people, like the new hive that I just put together a few days ago, has little ant cups on the legs. So these little plastic threaded cups that go over the legs, and the ants can't get through them. So some people put grease on the, the legs, and some people put toothpaste, mint toothpaste, on their hive stand. Now ants are related to bees. They are social insects. They're eusocial insects. They have a queen. Uh, they follow pheromones, uh, just like the bees do. But thank goodness the ants can't fly unless they're in swarm mode in spring, when all the queens fly out and start new colonies. So ants uh, can be easily disrupted with pheromones. So when you put mint and uh, like mint toothpaste and things like that on your hive stand around the edges, Ants won't cross it. They can't stand it. But you also have to keep everything else trimmed down to keep them out. Bottom line, do they hurt the bees? Probably not. So I think you're good to go. What kind of ants are they? The little sugar ants. Now, we're coming to the end here. This is the fluff section. This is the final thing. We can have a shout out here today too. And a lot of people have been wondering about this because somebody named Jason Bates wrote me. And uh, you have a big following in Australia, especially amongst hobby beekeepers. Please spread the message on why it's important and why we make every effort in stopping this nasty parasite. So we're talking about the road structure mite. If you don't know already, it's pretty much going throughout the beekeeping community that uh, <clears throat> there's part of Africa that is Varroa destructor mite free. The other big Varroa destructor mite free zone was Australia. Past tense. Australia has Varroa destructor mites now. New South Wales, where did they show up? Port of Newcastle, there were three hives most recently with Varroa mites there. If you're in Australia right now and you're concerned about what's going on, I'm going to put a link to your government uh, alert or information station there. The word is that they think they're going to get them under control. The bad news is, I mean, what good news could there be? The bad news is that uh, the control method is kind of like what we do here in the United States when it comes to American fowl brood. Uh, destruction of colonies or isolation and a lockdown. And they want to make sure the mites don't spread. So I'm sure they're trying to figure out how they got there by sea, probably, likely. Uh, they showed up in three hives. That's three too many. There are feral hives in that part of the world as well. Feral colonies might spread. I think I said it earlier on today. How many mites do you need to start an entire mite family inside your beehive? You need one mite. One. So it's a huge deal. I'm sure the reaction is going to be swift. And the action that they're going to take is going to be as thorough as it possibly can be, and they're going to depend on people in Australia to cooperate. Because that's the other end of things here, like we have chicken disease. Uh, we've had, uh, historically, we've had problems with poultry disease and people not cooperating with the Department of Agriculture and not cooperating with uh, control measures. People want to live off grid. People want to stay away from the government. They don't want the government in their business. Uh, so this is a time when people really should kind of cooperate, get together, and unify in dealing with the Varroa destructor mite. If you have any prayer of keeping it out, every colony has to be evaluated. So, um, 
there'll be a lot on that front, but please look at the, um, the website that I'm going to give you a link to because that is uh, from the government in Australia. And of course, they're the final word on what you should be doing. Uh, this is not, you know, just from my desk here in on my dirt road in the United States dealing with mites, never knowing what it was like to have bees without the Varroa destructor mite. Because that's a kind of a charmed existence. If you think you could have a hive without mites, we've been jealous of Australia all this time. So, but we know how mites spread. They spread through drift. They spread uh, through workers. When hives die out, often because of diseases that weaken them, that are carried by the Varroa destructor mite, uh, they get robbed. And so other healthy colonies of bees, the strongest, healthiest, largest colonies are number one to rob out and overcome weaker, smaller colonies. This is how the Varroa mite and diseases that are spread by the mite spread to healthy colonies and healthy apiaries. It's a big deal. Think about how many miles bees can fly. Where do they overlap? How many miles is the next batch from? Where just one mite needs to hitch a ride on the abdomen of one of those bees and it needs to fly out and get into another hive and now we have Varroa destructor mites in the next hive. How often can that happen? Well, kind of one of the scary things that uh, I demonstrated in my discussion today. Forages from colonies don't just have to be on a swarm. You know, to go and join another colony. They'll join when they smell queen mandibular pheromone that doesn't even belong to them. They're not identifying that queen at all. They found a queen pheromone and next thing you know a bunch of foragers are there with her. So that means uh, bees from any colony could join bees from any colony at any time. I don't know if they're gonna be able to get it under control. <clears throat> I hope they do. It'd be great if they did. But it's going to require, this is the worst part, beekeepers have to cooperate. And uh, if we know anything, a lot of beekeepers are very independently minded people that don't want to play anybody's game by anybody's rules. So, I mean, I hope that's not the case. Australia has managed to keep bees out. So this is why you should trust your government. Your government in Australia is the reason why you've not had to deal with Varroa destructor mites for all this time. They've been thorough. They've had sentinel hives out and they've got this early alert system, which is why we know about them. So I hope it works. Now that leads me directly into, we'll all be watching, we'll be updating. I have the word out to different people I want to talk to that are in New South Wales. And uh, we want to talk about my shout out for today. It's related to this. So we have our experts on the Varroa destructor mite. Of course, the top one that comes to mind or should, and it's part of my shout out today, is Dr. Samuel Ramsey, which people call him Sammy Ramsey. He got his doctorate, he has a PhD based on his Varroa destructor mite research. He's the man. And I'm going to send you to a video today for the shout out, which is hosted by Inside the Hive TV, which is Dr. Umberto Boncristiani. He's a friend. And so we're going to link you to that. That channel, by the way, is so undervisited. These are science-based people. Uh, these are people that do profound research, which then provide us with practical information that we can assign to our bee management in our own backyards on any level. So I'm going to send you to that. Please tell them that uh, I said hello because we're not just talking about the Varroa destructor mite. We're talking about tropolalaps, which is another mite that's out there. And uh, Dr. Ramsey is very difficult to get a hold of, or I would have reached out to him directly. I went to his YouTube, and uh, it's got him singing a song about um, cicadas. So that was funny. But anyway, that's it uh, for that uh, word on science. So that link will be down there. Please go to that. Look into those guys. I think people will be looking for expertise on Varroa destructor mites all over the world. And we certainly want to provide solutions. Those in Australia that are going to be facing the Varroa destructor mite 
uh, will of course be wanting to get up to speed and learn more about uh, how do people manage it in high mite areas and things like that. So wherever the bees are here, uh, we have row instructor mites. Genetics would be at the top of my list for the future hope against varroa destructor mites. But in the meantime, backyard beekeepers, uh, we can't really do a lot of genetic uh, work. We can work with local regional bees that handle other parts of uh, the challenging aspects of beekeeping. So if you've got regional bees that handle your climate, that are adapted to the annual cycle that you go through, uh, then you're also well ahead. The healthier your bees are, the more they can handle um, these loads of infection that the varroa destructor mites bring along. So bee nutrition, bee health, uh, colonies that don't require massive treatments in order to survive. So all of these things will, of course, be looked at. And uh, they'll have to have a plan. So I hope that the spread of varroa destructor mites is very slow. It took uh, 50 years for the varroa mite to spread around here. And uh, of course they were brought in by beekeepers that uh, brought them with their hives, with their bees. And that's the way that you shut them down. You don't have uh, beehives being shipped and tracked all over the country to every zone, to every ag zone, to every part, every region, because the bees themselves carry the mites with them. So the more migratory our bee practices are, our, our commercial beekeeping practices spread diseases, spread mites, just by virtue of the fact that they're constantly mobile. And so uh, I don't know what the impact is going to be on people that are commercial beekeepers there in Australia, um, especially if they shut you down and they prevent you from migrating around. I don't know if this is throughout New South Wales, for example, if, if you're locked in place and you're a commercial beekeeper and you depend on pollinating contracts, then of course the spinoff of this would be significant. So our thoughts are with the people in Australia and we hope uh, that uh, they figure it out and that they can lock down what's going on there. And my number one word of advice based on the question that I was given would be to please be informed what your government is saying and uh, please comply, you know, help out, contribute, do what they say. Don't move your hives. Don't buy in packages now. Don't trade bees with each other. And uh, don't spread. That's what I would do. I would, you know, be all in, locked down. That's how I avoid uh, bird disease, for example, too. Don't bring anything in and don't send anything out. Don't sell or buy livestock now. So that's it for today. And uh, sorry that's a sad note there, but I hope you guys are going to have a fantastic weekend. Hope you enjoy your 4th of July. If you're traveling, looks like you could have lots of problems with aircraft, but uh, I'm staying right here. I'm staying in my yard. So happy 4th to everybody, and uh, for the rest of you out there, I wish you all the best in beekeeping. Have a fantastic weekend. Mm -hmm.